good morning. It's good to see y'all today. If you would, go ahead and take your Bible and let's open it up to the book of Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. And I've got good news for you today. Those of you, not everybody in here today actually has to listen to the message that I'm going to preach because if this particular situation in your life does not apply to you, and you have managed to make it to that plateau in your life where you do not sin anymore. You do not have to listen to what I have to say because I know you're not going to listen anyway because you're so eat up with sin you won't even know you got sin, okay? But the rest of you, the rest of you who are conscious that there's a, a handful, maybe one, maybe two, maybe five, six sins that you just as soon push out of your life but you hadn't been able to get victory over those things. You, you, you want, you know you don't need to do these things. You know that it breaks your heart. You know it grieves God and it just eats at you on the inside. This message is for you today. And this is one I pulled out of the book of Acts and I'm going to go back at Acts when I come back in, in, in August when we come back and start over, uh, kind of start the rest of the church here. We're going to pick up with Saul's conversion going from there. So God laid this message upon my heart over the last couple of months because I do see as a pastor and as a long-term pastor and one pastor for 20 years, I have begun to see, you know, some people are able to break through the bonds of some particular sins in their lives, and then some people are not able to break through the bonds of those lives. And I, I've held many folks' hands through the years trying to help them get through, and some do good, and then some you think they're going to make it, and they just fall off in, in the deep end, and before too long, the sin just consumes them and eats them up, and, and they exist no more. So what I want to talk about today is really going to, even though I don't frame it this way, it, the, the, the real thing that I hope the message is going to teach today is how to go and sin no more. Because you remember Jesus when he saw the woman at the well and everybody picked up the stone, not the woman at the well, but when they saw the woman who had been caught in adultery, they all picked up the stones and they got ready to stone her and then Jesus said to the crowd, you remember what Jesus said to the crowd, what well, he said to the crowd, let he who is without sin cast the first stone and everybody dropped their sins and left. But do y'all remember what he said to the woman after everybody had left? He said, where, where are your accusers? And then Jesus says to her, Go and sin no more. And we all, find, we, you know, we all feel that way. We know that we've messed up, and we know we've got to go and sin no more. But we just really have a hard time with that. I mean, it's just so difficult. Well, laid out in the whole of Scripture is the answer to how you deal with that from a day-to-day, -day, day -day basis. Now, the first thing we don't, here, here's, here's one of the deals we don't want. We don't want anybody to know that we have a problem with sin. Now look, look at your neighbor on your right. Just look at him. Now look at your neighbor on your left. Just look at him. Now both of those people you just looked at, they got a problem with sin. But don't get too cocky because the one they were looking at when you were looking at them has got a problem with sin too. And it's going to take all of us. It's going to take a community. It's going to take a small group of people. It's going to take some people in your lives to help you get to where you need to be. And I hope that's what you'll pull from the message tonight. And I'm going to give you a big, I mean this morning, I'm going to give you a big snapshot picture of, of what we're going to have today. And, 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 in, and what, what, what you're going to learn, we're going to look at the text in just a second, but what you're going to learn today is this, that God calls individuals. There was a time in your life when you didn't even know you were lost. And God woke you up, showed you, he said, come and follow me. And you made the decision to go and follow him. And then since you've been, in the, since you've been under the teaching of the word of God, somewhere along the way, he's revealed to you that you're selfish. And in that selfishness, you got to kill who you are on the inside. That, that self-centered person that you have, you got, you, you got to do away with that person so that when you do away with that person, then Christ begins to become him Jesus in you and transform you into the image of his son. So, so well, you become a new creation in Christ because you've decided to, to, to stop sin because you've decided to kill the person who sins inside of you. So he sends the Holy Spirit to live in you, a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then after he does that, he does a wonderful thing that many of you don't even know that he's done. And this is what he's done. He's brought you and he's connected you to a people who have like problems that you do. He's brought you into a smaller group. He's brought you into, into a neighborhood. He's brought you, he's put you in contact with another person or two or three or four that deals with what you deal with. And as the, the two, the three, the four, or five of you begin to open up and actually honestly talk about the stuff 
that you deal with. You begin to help each other, and there's a strength in that. And in that strength, that propels you to have less sin in your life. And as it propels you to have less sin in your life, then what you do is you realize this is an amazing thing that God has done in you. So you participate in the carrying of the gospel out to the rest of the world. And then you figure out that the very reason that you were put on the earth was to carry that gospel to the outermost parts of the earth. And then you begin to have purpose and meaning of your life. And then your life is filled with absolute joy. The very same joy that you're trying to find when you commit the sin that you commit in your life that you keep committing over and over and over again. Because after all, deep down inside, don't we all just want to be filled with joy? Don't we just want to feel good? Don't you just want to wake up and it be sun shining outside? Don't you just want to wake up and not and step outside the door and not step in a foot and a half of water? Don't you just want to wake up and just everybody one day just be in a good mood and everything be like it's supposed to be and then you just be able to be happy with who you are? And that's where we're headed in our lives. That's what we're going to look at as we look at the scriptures today. So I'm going to shoot a whole bunch of scriptures, but we're going to jump off this one that I find in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, where it says, He has saved us. Now, he, it's, it's him. He, he did all the work. He did all the saving. And he has called us with a holy calling. Now, the holy calling that he's called us with is to live sanctified, to live set apart, to be brought out from the world so that we no longer have sin in our lives. So the process is to get, to get all that sin out of our lives. And it's not according to our works. It's not the works that we do that push the sin out of us. It's the work that God does inside of us as we just follow his plan. But according to his own purpose and grace, and by the way, he's got a purpose for your life, and grace is in that purpose that he has on you because he's forgiven you everything you got in your past, everything that's even going on with you now, which was given to us in Christ Jesus. And this all happened before the beginning of time. And all God's people said, now how are we going to do that? How's all this stuff going to work out? Now, now, Jesus saves us and then he fills us with the Spirit. Then he keeps each one of us accountable by working together and then carrying out his purpose. So the first thing that you have to get right in your life is this one right here that says, our selfish self-awareness. Now how many of y'all are self-aware and know that you exist? You know, you've got a soul. You've got a a mind, you got an intellect, you've got a nature, you've got, uh, you got an ego, you've got a thing that lets you know that you are who you are, and that thing that lets you think in your head, that thing that has you thinking about how you feel and the things you want to do, that's the part of you that makes you you, and that's what separates you from the animal kingdom. Did you realize that? Your dog does not sit at you and think the things that you're thinking. When your dog looks at you and he smiles at you, the reason he's smiling is there's a box of treats right behind you and he wants one of those treats, okay? But you sit and you ponder and you think about the things that will make you happy in life and you think about God and you think about yourself and you think about all these things. So as you're trying to process all that, what you come to the conclusion with through Scripture and through the teaching of the Word that you are a very selfish individual. Because you want what you want, when you want it, and you want it just the particular way that you want it so that you can be happy. And if you do get all of that stuff done, then you find out that you're still not happy anyway. That's why Jesus taught abundantly we must die to self. Jesus is the one who said in Luke 23, uh, and then he said to them all, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself Take up his cross daily and follow me. But now Jesus is not the only one who told us that. The apostle Paul figured this out. He tried to keep the law and he couldn't do it. And he realized, so that's when he says in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And he's not the only one who figured that out either because Peter even helps us understand it. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, he says, he himself bore our sins on his body on a tree so that so that having died to sin us having crucified self having died to sin might live for righteousness might let Christ live in us you have been healed by his wounds now see we are healed from the sin when we learn to die to self 
So we got to learn to do it his way. Now, every person has an ego. Every person has a spirit. They have an inner self. They have an emotional center. They have a reasoning. Today, I'm calling it a self-awareness. And in that self-awareness, it is absolutely, it's absolutely selfish in every way. Now, this selfish, sinful awareness. Now, you think it's easy for me to say that, don't you? Selfish, sinful, self-awareness. Help me say that. Sinful self-awareness. Now you say that three more times in your head. You can do it in your head, but you can't do it out loud. But it's exactly what we are. This selfish self-awareness is what we put to death. It was broken in the Garden of Eden, and it was fixed when Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose from the grave to get us back to where we need to be. Romans 8.10 says, Now, if in Christ, now if Christ is in you, right, you died to self, Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. That sin kills you, right? But the spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, when the spirit comes in, you're made back alive again. So that sinful thing is pushed outside of you. We must die daily, Romans 12, verses 1, 2, 1 and 2. Uh, Therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices. So every day you've got to die to the selfish, sinful, self-awareness that you have. Holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. So you're worshiping God when you start putting to death the you that's in you holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual worship. But do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So God's got to renew something in your head so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, the perfect will of God. So we all got to come to the realization that we've got to die to self, and it's no longer us who lives, but Christ who lives in us. And I'm not going to camp out there because I've preached that to you for the last four or five years at the church on a regular basis. This is the next step that we got to get to in our lives is this right here. Our... Self-awareness gives way to life in Christ. Okay, if you're dead on the inside, if you've crucified who you are, now there is plenty of room for Jesus to be Jesus in you. So what happens is Jesus begins to take hold. Romans 8, 10, and 11 says, now if Christ is in you, so if he's in you, if, if, he's, if you're dead, then Christ is in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, look at this, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through his spirit who lives in you. So you were dead, but now you're going to be made alive in Christ. So you are a new creation. That's the reason we hear that verse of Scripture and we read that verse of Scripture in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, what is he? He's a new creation. Old things have passed away and look, new things have come. And then, and then we understand that we are a new creation that is empowered by the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus told his disciples whenever he, when the 500 people who had gathered around him and he's ascending up into heaven, he gathers them around and he says, all authority has been given to me. And he says, go therefore and make disciples. And, 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 and when we read that same passage in Acts chapter one, we see in there he says, you shall receive when the Holy Spirit comes on you. So when the Holy Spirit moves into you, there's a magnificent new power that you do not possess until you're dead in Christ and that is living in you. When that lives in you, it gives you this power has the ability to overcome all the sin that is in your life. So we're a new creation. I love what Ezekiel said. I know, I know many of y'all lay awake all night long and read the book of Ezekiel. It's just a wonderful midnight read. But there's one verse of scripture there in Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 27. It says, I will place my spirit within you. And I love the next few words. It says, and cause you to follow my statutes and carefully observe my commands. I just wish God would just cause me to say and to do and act the way that I ought to act because every time I take control of my life, I do the wrong thing. 
You got that? You understand that? That's what takes place when we let the Spirit be the Spirit in us. You must stay connected to the vine daily. And this is where a lot of people mess up. They come to, they learn to die to self. They stay connected to the Word. They start doing pretty good. So if they're doing pretty good, they can walk away from the Word. If they walk away from the Word, they fall. And that's why John in chapter 15, verses 1 through 5, reminds us we got to stay connected to Jesus because we don't daily stay connected to Jesus. The us in us will come back to life. And as it comes back to life, it'll start carrying us off in the wrong direction. John said, I am the vine, and my father is the vine keeper. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he, remi- and re- uh, he produces fruit, he removes, and he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. You're already clean because of my word I have spoken to you, not because of what you've done, but because of who Jesus is. Remain in me, and I in you. So as long as he remains in us, Just as a branch is unable to produce fruit by itself unless you remain on the vine, so neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit because you can do nothing without me. So one of the things, this is what I want you to see from this part of the message. To break, to break the daily connection with Christ is to fall into sin and to return to the old way of life. If you're not in the Word of God, and not just reading the Word of God, if you're not connected to Jesus in the Word of God, to break the connection is to be assured of unholiness. To break the connection is to be assured that that sin that you were able to walk away from is going to move itself right back in your life and take over you once again in your life. Which brings me to the third thing I want to talk about today. Our self-awareness must be stay connected to the body of Christ. Now, who is the body of Christ? Help me here. We are. We are. We make the body of Christ. Jesus does have a body on earth. And his body on earth is us as we come together to work together. Now you are a part of the body and you cannot uh, sever or be disconnected from the body. It says, it says in scripture, so the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Or again, to the head cannot say to the foot, I don't need you. Because if you cut the head off, the foot can't work. Uh, if you, I mean, you got to have everything that works in there. You can't not see it in your life. You can't not be who you're supposed to be if there's not other people around you involved with you in the things that are going on. Now, this is what you want to do. This is what you want to do. Listen to me. Everybody listen to me. Let's do it. Let's do it. Some people like to pull away from the body so that nobody will be around them because everybody else makes them uncomfortable. And since nobody around is around them, they can do whatever they want to right here. And when you're right here doing whatever you want to, you're being selfish. The very thing you were supposed to kill to start with. And when you get selfish... Nobody is there to help protect you and you grab whatever sin that is that so easily entangles you because you don't even see it coming. It's so natural in your life. So Christ moves in and he changes who we are. We've begun to come together and believers keep one another sharp. That's why we gather around in small groups. That's why we gather around and we preach the word because as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. God did not create a person to be alone. God put man in the Garden of Eden and he said, it is not good, what? For the man to be alone. Now, I know we always preach that in a a marriage-type context, but it's not good for man to be alone. You know why it's not good for man to be alone? Because if a man is left alone, he's going to sin. You know, it's, good for, it's not good for a woman to be alone either because if a woman's alone, she's going to sin. If we can be separated from the world, we will do whatever we want to do because nobody else will know what it is that we're doing. We have no accountability. We have to worry about it. And when you've got a particular sin in your life, you're always looking what for a way to get away from the people so that you can do what it is you want to do in your life because nobody is around. If you don't believe me, check yourself. Every time you fall back into that sin that you've got, are you by yourself? Or are you with somebody else? <laughs> Chances are you've pulled away from this group and gone over here and fallen back into that sin. God did not create a person to be alone. There is strength in unity. I love it. I'm going to preach on this tonight, so I won't camp out right here, but Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up. But pity the one who falls without another to help lift him up. 
Also, if two lie down together, they can keep warm. But how can one person also keep warm? And if someone overpowers one person, two can resist him. A cord of three stands is not easily broken. So if you have two or three people in your life, I'm not talking about 12 million people. I'm not talking about the whole church knowing all of your business. By the way, let me stop right here and say this. If the whole church knows your business, You may want to find you another church because you'll never be happy in that church because the whole church knows your business. Okay? I don't want you knowing all my business because then I got to explain to you everything I do just so that you'll be happy since you know my business. So the church ain't got no business knowing all the business that everybody's in the church and all the church people said. But somebody in the church needs to know your business. But somebody in the church needs to know your business. One, two, three, maybe five people that you trust with everything that you have. They need to know the sins you deal with. They need to struggle. And nobody else needs to know. And you need to gather together in a small group. And you need to pray for each other. And you need to cry with each other. And you need to hurt with one another. And when you're tempted, you need to be able to call one of those people in that small group and say, look, I need you to talk to me. Because I really am tempted. Let me tell you how temptation works. Temptation is not for days and days and days and days. Temptation comes in waves. Y'all ever been to the beach and got caught in one of those waves where it just knocked you down, swooshed you down, and you got your bathing suit all full of sand and all that kind of stuff? Temptation comes in waves. And if you have somebody to help hold you up, when a wave hits, you can stand up. If you have somebody to help hold you up, you're going down. <laughs> When you're going down, you go under the water. And you go under the water, if you can't get back up, you'll drown and die. That's why you need somebody else to help pick you up. Because it's awful hard to knock twenty to knock five people down, but it's easy to knock one person down. We bear one another's burdens. We carry one another's burdens in this way. You will fulfill the law of Christ. Walking in fellowship works its way out in the cleansing from sin. Now, I love this verse of Scripture, John, 1 John 6, 1 through 7. I hear people say this all the time. Well, you don't have to belong to the church to be a Christian. And I have a theological response to that. You ready for it? Wrong! You cannot be a Christian and not belong to the body of Christ and be associated with that body of Christ. And if you can walk away from the body of Christ and you can stay there for more than a short period of time, you are not a part of the body of Christ and you are lost, lost, lost. And we find that in the Word. First off, it tells you not to forsake the assembly of the brothers because you've got to be together. But 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, We have fellowship with one another. Therefore, if there's no fellowship with one another, there is no light. And if there is no light, there is darkness. And if there is darkness, then you are lost, lost, lost. You're just making yourself feel like you're saved. But guess what? You're here. You're here because you needed, you know, you needed something. You knew you needed somebody. You knew you needed Jesus. So you came. And you keep coming back. No matter how hard Brother Steve preaches, you keep coming back. Why? Because you're learning how to die to self. And because Jesus is becoming Jesus in you. And you're starting to realize that without that person that sits next to you, you don't have the sandpaper you need to have to smooth you off. Daryl, I need you to be a piece of sandpaper. Hold your hand up in the air like that. This is a piece of sandpaper. No, hold, keep holding. Keep holding. <laughs> I'm a rough, gruff guy, and I'm all twisted up, but I come over here to Daryl, and he sands on me, and before too long, I straighten up my smooth out. If I hadn't had Daryl in my life to help get me to where I need to be, I'd walk away all crooked and twisted and everything. See, it takes some pressure in our lives. It takes some accountability in our lives. And you got that small group of people who can hold you that way. 
you're going to push that sin out of your life. Because you don't want to have to look them in the eye when they say, well, how's the pornography thing going? Well, I hadn't looked at anything for days. They know you're lying. When you've got to be accountable, it helps a lot. And it says in 1 John 1, 7, it goes on and it says, but if we walk in the light as he himself is light, we have fellowship with one another. And then look at the last part of this verse. And the blood of his son Jesus does what? Help me. Cleanses us from how many sins? So when we are together, the sin is pushed out. When we keep pulling back and don't let anybody know we're dealing with a sin... Our selfishness is pushing Christ out so that the sin can take over inside of us. Mm. All right, here's the fourth thing. None of this works. If you take any one, one, two, three, or four out of the mix, it all falls apart. If you don't die to self, it falls apart. If Christ is not living in you, it falls apart. If you don't have somebody accountable with you, it falls apart. Now, brings me to the last one. An individual, as individuals, we must actively participate in our specific God-given good works. God created you with a purpose in mind, and he intends for you to carry that purpose out. And when you find him, he shows you what that purpose is, and you begin to fill it out. Now, there's a thing called the principle of the filling of the void. The principle of the filling of the void. In a vacuum, if you pull one thing out, Something has to go back in its place. Now, you'll hear this talked about, the principle itself, you'll hear it talked about on CNN and Fox News. and all. You listen to all these political commentators and they say, well, if you go into a country and you decapitate the head of the country and you take the, you take the ruler out of the country, what's going to happen? Somebody else is going to step up and a vacuum is going to pull that leader out a new lady's going to be created and it's going to start taking over everything's done. It's not going to exist without that thing. This is what I'm trying to help you see. If you do not do the good works that God created you to do, the old works that you used to do will come back in your life and you will do them. Therefore, your purpose in life is to share Jesus Christ with everybody you come to contact with. Your purpose in life is to help make disciples of Christ. Now, if you stop doing that and you don't do that, the vacuum's going to fill. You say, where in the world do you find that? I'm glad somebody asked you. You could either go to Matthew chapter 12 or you could go to Luke chapter 11, but I'm going to read to you from Luke. Listen to Luke 12, 43 and 45. Listen to what Jesus has to say. It's one of those weird things that when you just read it, you don't know what in the world he's talking about, but this is what he's talking about. It says, Jesus said, when an unclean spirit comes out of a man, when his self comes out, it roams through the water of this place is looking for rest, but it doesn't find it. Then it says, I'll go back to my house that I came from, and after returning, it finds the house vacant, swept, and put in order, nice and clean. Then off it goes, and it brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and settle down there. As a result, the man's last condition is worse than the first. That's how it will be with this evil generation. Okay. I died of self. Okay. I don't like me. I'm crucifying myself. Jesus comes in. Okay, I'm starting to like who I am because I'm more like Jesus than I used to be, so I feel pretty good about who I am. But I do I know I have some sins I got a problem with, so I need a little help. So I gather me four or five people to come around me, and we talk about it, and now I'm doing good, and I'm getting those sins out of my life, and now I just want to be left alone, God, to do my own thing. So instead of doing what you're supposed to do, something's got to fill that void that used to take up all your time before. And what you do is, you go back. Okay, maybe you were doing drugs before, but this time you don't do drugs. But you need something. You can fill it with service for Christ, or you can fill it with food and gain 400 pounds. <coughs> you illustrate my point? There are people that you know you might be one of them. I used to smoke, but I quit smoking. And after I quit smoking, I started eating. The void 
something else comes in. If your purpose isn't to fulfill the good works that God created you to fulfill, sins, seven times worse, are going to come into your life and they're going to destroy. If you profess Christ, die to self-awareness, but do not do the good works God has for you, you will fall into sin that will consume you, destroy you, and kill you. How many people have you ever known that you just knew that you knew that you knew that they were born again believers of Jesus Christ, yet they drank themselves to death, yet they drugged themselves to death, yet they ate themselves to death? Why? Because they didn't want the other people telling them what was wrong in their own life. The feeling you receive at death is Christ. The feeling of your void from drugs or from alcohol or from sin must be good works. Or it's going to be sex, porn, food, one of those other things. I, I want to close out by asking a couple of quick questions. Number one, is God calling you to die? Are you dead to self? Is that where you are? That's the first part. Get it right. Die. Maybe is God empowering you with his Holy Spirit? You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. If there is no power in your life to be able to be transformed into the image of Jesus, maybe it's because you hadn't died to self and you're too happy being who you are. Stop being who you are so that you be who Christ created you to be and find happiness. Third, are you connected to the body of Christ in an honest, open fellowship with Christ-centered people? around you. God loves you so much that he will send people to encircle you. All you got to do is ask him. All you got to do is open your eyes and you're going to find those particular people. Are you actively pursuing and doing the particular good work that God has created you to do? And I can promise you one, two, three, four. Die, be filled, surround yourself with godly believers, get on the mission. You're going to find more joy in your walk with Christ than you ever knew even existed. Dear God in heaven,